from the headquarters of Tell Us Your English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Venezuela's Interior Minister Nesta Reverol has denounced a plan to stage false flags operations on the border with Colombia to undermine Venezuela's security. The plan had been mentioned by President Nicolas Maduro on Thursday. Reverol said the information came from sources within the Colombian armed forces. We hereby denounce a serious and dangerous plan we have detected to create false flag events following an increase in violence on our border with Colombia. We have information and clear proof of the recruitment of Venezuelan citizens by the Colombian army. This is very serious, that the Colombian army should be recruiting Venezuelan citizens, giving them fast-track Colombian identity papers, ID cards, and then immediately incorporating them into Colombia's obligatory military service. The Minister of the Interior also said that the Venezuelan government will be seeking to address the issue directly with the Colombian authorities. As a result, we confirm the instructions given by the President of Venezuela and Commander-in-Chief of the Bolivarian Armed Forces that General Vladimir Padrino, Minister of Defense, will contact directly the Colombian Defense Minister to coordinate permanent means of communication about the details contained in this denunciation. We are obliged by our history to be brother nations forever. As Venezuela prepares for its presidential election, the Somos Venezuela group, led by Delcy Rodriguez and the Socialist Party, PSUV, have presented their manifestos. They're encouraging people to vote for a peaceful Venezuela. Our correspondent, Laura Prada, has moved from Caracas. Just a few hours ago, Delcy Rodriguez, leader of the Somos Venezuela movement, said that their biggest commitment is to the 10 million voters, which they had promised President Hugo Chavez they would obtain. They will also continue with social policies to help Venezuelan families, which they have been promoting over the last few months. Meanwhile, Diosdado Cabello called for people to mobilize this weekend throughout the country. The Somos Venezuela movement will introduce the candidates for different states. Both leaders have asked the people of Venezuela to vote and bet for a peaceful and sovereign Venezuela. The Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Ariasa is in the Dominican Republic as he continues his tour of the region to promote peace and integration. Our correspondent, Esther Yanez, has more from Santo Domingo. Saludos desde Santo Domingo. Greetings from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, the last stop of Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza's dignity tour that has also brought him to Dominica and El Salvador. This marks the end of his Latin American tour. Next week, he heads to Europe and Africa. Today, the minister will meet with his counterpart, Foreign Minister Miguel Vargas, and later on, he will meet with different social movements and organizations that came from all over the country to show their support and solidarity to Venezuela. The purpose of his tour is to strengthen friendship ties with other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean ahead of Venezuelan elections on April 22nd. This stop in the Dominican Republic is particularly important because it was here where the Venezuelan government, a bit more than a week ago, signed the Peace and Unity Agreement, an agreement that the opposition decided not to sign after a phone call from the Colombian president at the request of U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who also threatened Venezuela with new sanctions and an oil embargo. These topics and more will be discussed by Arreaza and his counterpart Vargas. Michel Temer has declared a state of emergency in the northern Brazilian state of Horama. He said this was in response to the influx of Venezuelans entering the country via the state capital, Boa Vista. The declaration will provide funding for infrastructure and humanitarian help for the 40,000 Venezuelans who have crossed the border. Temer will also double the number of troops in the area to 2,000, build more control posts and a field hospital for migrants. Also in Brazil, Michel T President T Timur has taken a very controversial measure of calling in the army to curb violence in Rio de Janeiro. The president spoke at the signing of the act earlier today. 
Organized crime has virtually taken control of the state of Rio de Janeiro. It's a cancer that has extended throughout the country and threatens the tranquility of our nation. For that reason, we have just called for a federal intervention in the public security for Rio de Janeiro. And with more on this story, we go to Adriana Robreño in Rio de Janeiro. Today, Brazilian President Michel Temer and the governor of Rio de Janeiro signed a decree ordering the armed forces to take command of police forces in the state of Rio de Janeiro. This means that they'll have the right to intervene militarily in the region using force, something that has been very controversial. There have been several recent instances in Rio where the armed forces intervened in the capital city, particularly its presence during the Olympics, where militarization was widely reported but never officially decreed. This means that an army commander will act as governor and gives them heightened powers. There are those who say the solution for Rio is not to ramp up military intervention in order to combat the escalating violence during the final days of Carnival, but rather to change Governor Luis Fernando Pesao. This decree was signed today, but will need to be passed by the Congress within 24 hours and voted on within 10 days. Once passed, it comes into effect and will be valid until the end of 2018. A new report alleges that the Brazilian firm Odebrecht presented false documents in court in order to incriminate former president Luiz Ignacio Lula de Silva. The report cites a police expert's analysis requested by the former president's defense team, which alleges the construction firm falsified evidence of bribes to politicians. The documents analyzed are part of the operation Operation Car Wash investigation into a beachside apartment next to Lula's in San Bernardo del Campo. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. The indigenous people in the Colombia Department of Choco have fallen victim to the violence between the government and the ELN. In January, Colombian forces bombarded a remote area called San Juan Littoral. Many of those bombs landed close to the homes of the Wunan people. Our correspondent, Lorena Hoyos, traveled to the region to assess the damage. This is the second part of a special series. <laughs> It's dawn, and uncertainty takes over the safe house in the Wuna community. The indigenous people here take us through the road that leads to Tordo River. Our boots are covered with mud, making this journey slower. It is painfully apparent how close the homes of this community are to the area bombarded by the military last month. These huts that are burnt, those are not the guerrilla. They belong to the indigenous, the campesinos. We go away to hunt for three or four days. That is how we protect the community, how we get food. 
The indigenous people used the word jury to say war, and that is how Salomon describes this attack. That night, he was with his family at the hut when the roar of the explosion forced them to flee. They were forced to hide in the river to save their lives. We heard a small plane above our hut. I told my family we are not going to give up. I took a canoe and went to the river. We stayed there until dawn, and as we came back, we saw all the destruction. The women of the community remember scared kids running that night. They say that from that day, fear has taken over their lives, and they can no longer go to the mountains to have as plant fibers to knit their crafts. They only have limited supplies left, and they fear that they will not be able to survive. Everything we need, soap, salt, food, we buy with the money we get from our crafts. Most of the women here knit to be able to do that. And if we don't, how are we going to buy anything? The Wunan have survived neglect and abandonment from the Colombian state. Two years ago, the government built a health center to help the Afro-Indigenous community. But the doctors never came. And with time, promises were forgotten. Every person in the community, Afro and indigenous, are sons of the government. They need to have peace, not violence or bombardments on their territory. The Wunan indigenous hold on to their culture and traditions. Carlos Julio heals the illnesses of the community with medicinal plants, something he learned from his father. He said the worst illnesses are consequences of fear. Fear forces the soul, or chimia in Wunan dialect, to abandon their bodies. Big scares force the spirit to leave the body and stay where that happened. Then you get sick. And if you don't consult with someone who knows about this, you can die. The Wunan say that since the attack, several indigenous people have fallen ill. War is very hard. We had to endure the attacks, the needs we have to face because we cannot go to the mount. If the public force sees us there with boots, they may think we are guerrillas. It's hard for us. We're not living in peace. For the Wunan people, calm is peace. In the last seven years, this community has been attacked four times, killing three indigenous girls. They are hopeful that the ELN and the government will reach a ceasefire agreement. They say that that is the only way they can preserve their lives. In Argentina, families of crew members of a missing submarine have gathered outside a Buenos Aires naval base to pay tribute to their relatives. The families marched to the naval base demanding that the government continue searching for the 44 submariners. The government has announced a $4.8 million reward for information on the location of the submarine. The vessel disappeared in 2017. The president needs to continue searching for the remains of the submarine. Three months ago, our relatives disappeared. The president is responsible for this. We need answers and we want action to find the 44 crew members. Peru's former president, Olanta Humala, is refusing to answer questions from a commission investigating the 1992 killings at the Madre Mia military base where he was a commander. The commission reportedly posed more than 100 questions without answer. Humala was detained last year in a separate corruption case. The Madre Mia Commission visited him in prison to question him on the alleged extrajudicial executions and torture. Huma lawyers has accused Alberto Fujimori and the congressman leading the investigation of politically lynching Humala. In Peru, indigenous communities in the Loreto region are asking the government to declare a state of emergency. They say their water is contaminated after more than 2,000 oil spills over the last four decades. The communities claim that the oil leaks in the Peruvian jungle has put their homes, the economy, and people's lives at risk. The agreement on the environmental sustainability signed last year in the Zaramula Pact were not respected by the government. They're also asking the government to revise the contract with Plus Petrol the company that produces 40% of the oil in the country, and to fix the damage caused by the drillings. At least 25 tractor trailers and other heavy machinery have been destroyed in an arson attack in southern Chile. The attack happened in the heavily forested Araucania region, 
the heart of Chile's forestry and paper industry. The local Mapuche indigenous people say companies are taking their ancestral land and stripping it of its natural resources. No word yet on who was responsible for the latest attack. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Analyzing a river, grafting a fruit tree, educating a person, transforming a state. These are instances of fruitful criticism and, at the same time, instances of art. On the critical attitude, Bertolt Brecht. Welcome back. Noam Chomsky is possible, possibly the world's most renowned linguist and one of the foremost intellectuals in recent decades. In an exclusive interview with Telesio, he talked about foreign intervention in politics, the challenges facing society, and the role of U.S. President Donald Trump. From the point of view of U.S. power, he's harming it. But from the point of view of U.S. elites, He's giving them everything they want. I mean, in fact, what's going on in the United States, if you think about it, is kind of a two-level uh, wrecking ball, if you want to call it that. Uh, Trump, his role, whether this is conscious or not, I don't know, but you can see what, what's happening. Trump's role is to ensure that the media and its public attention are always concentrated on him. So every time you turn on a television set, it's Trump. They open the front page of the newspaper, Trump. And while this show is going on in public, the, uh, well, in the background, uh, the wrecking crew is working. Uh, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, uh, um, the guys in the cabinet who write bill. his uh, executive orders. And what they're doing is systematically dismantling every aspect of government that works for the benefit of the population. Uh, this goes from workers' rights to uh, uh, pollution, pollution, pollution of the environment, uh, uh, you know, rules for uh, protecting consumers. I mean, anything you can think of is being dismantled. And all efforts are being devoted, kind of almost with fanaticism, to enrich and empower their actual constituency, which is super wealth and corporate power. And that is happening at the peril of the planet. Chomsky says warnings about global warming and the impact of the use of petroleum have fallen on deaf ears. Who know that what they're doing is destroying the prospects for Thank human, organized human life and do it anyway because they make more profit tomorrow. Uh, can you think of an analog to that in human history? I, I really can't. I mean, I've said sometimes uh, what's considered an out utterly outrageous comment that the 
today's Republican Party is the most dangerous organization in human history. It sounds outrageous, but think about it for a moment. I mean, Hitler didn't intend to destroy the prospects for human existence. Uh, Attila the Hun didn't intend that. Nobody has. But that's what these guys intend. The other threat, nuclear war, which he says is becoming more of a reality. And it's not a joke. It's uh, global warming and nuclear war. Those are the major issues. They ought to be big headlines every day. And Trump's uh, actions are making both of them much more dangerous. In the case of nuclear war, the policies are significantly increasing the threat of nuclear war. And then there's the question of whether the United States is fit to play the role of the world's police or whether this is just interference. Well, the concept of humanitarian intervention is a very interesting one. Almost every act by any great power is uh, aggressive act is justified on humanitarian grounds. So from the point of view of the aggressor, it's a humanitarian intervention, not from the point of view of the victims. And you can see more of this Tell Us Your exclusive interview with Noam Chomsky online on our webpage at tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. Now let's have a look at some other stories making headlines from around the world. Good afternoon. The U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller has indicted 13 Russian nationals, accusing them for meddling in the 2016 presidential elections. They will be charged with conspiracy to defraud the United States. However, the U.S. Deputy Attorney General says there is no suggestion they managed to influence the outcome of the election, which brought current President Donald Trump to power. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa vowed to build a society defined by decency and integrity during his State of the Nation address in Cape Town. The 65-year-old was sworn in as head of state on Thursday after former President Jacob Zuma resigned on orders of the ANC. We are determined to build a society defined by decency and integrity that does not tolerate the plunder of public resources nor the theft by corporate criminals of the hard-earned savings of ordinary people. Protesters in the Palestinian-occupied territory have confronted Israeli defense forces on the 24th anniversary of the Patriarch's Massacre, which left 29 people dead and 125 wounded. Protesters were pushed back by Israeli military using tear gas and stun grenades. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has met with British Prime Minister Theresa May as Britain tries to negotiate a Brexit trade deal with the EU that maintains access to the single market. I am curious to see how Great Britain sees the partnership, and of course we have interests. As far as economic obligations go, we obviously want to keep a close partnership. Turkish police have attempted to control a crowd of demonstrators protesting against the visit of U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and the U.S. support for airstrike attacks in Syria. The Jamaican bear company Red Stripe has stepped in to help the female bobsled team get back on track at the Winter Olympics in South Korea. Coach Sandra Kirixis left the team abruptly this week and took her sled with her. That's when Red Stripe stepped in and donated a new one. The team confirmed they've accepted the gesture. The exact price of the sled is unknown, but in a tweet, Red Stripe said, no problem, just put it on their tab. February 16th marks the Lunar New Year, and not only China is celebrating, from South America to Australia and beyond, thousands are welcoming the New Year. The Chinese community welcomes in the Lunar New Year in the most faraway places. In Mexico's own Chinatown, the celebrations date back three decades. Each year, more Mexicans join the traditional lion and dragon dance to bring good luck. The New Year is a change for everyone. It gives a lot of luck and prosperity for everyone. I like being here and dancing. It means a lot to me to shake away the bad spirits with these dragons and the food. This tradition began in China. It has found a way to blend with locals everywhere it goes. 
In Hong Kong, it's no wonder Mickey Mouse and the famous Hello Kitty have taken over the traditional parade. So uh, dynamic uh, and so uh, cheerful. People are just having fun, amusing, uh, and uh, just uh, an atmosphere of, uh, of cherishing. This year is the year of the dog. And in Australia, with a large Chinese working community, a glimpse of their own culture brings them one step closer to home. We live overseas, far away from our family and friends, and we have to work for our future. So being with friends is very important on occasions like this. And it's not just humans who celebrate. In the Philippines, the puppies receive blessings in their own parade and fashion show. Dogs will be lucky this year because it is the year of the dogs, but actually dog lovers are lucky every minute because they have dogs loving them. For dogs and their faithful owners, the New Year will, they hope, bring days of love, laughter, and perhaps endless walks in the park. We've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisiotv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.